Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better, faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. Well, I'm delighted to welcome with um, open arms uh, Dan Abrahams to the podcast, long overdue. Um, We've had a couple of Skype conversations on both occasions. I thought to myself, should be recording this for the podcast, but we never did. But actually, we've managed to make it work. Your schedule, my schedule. Dan, welcome. Stuart, I'm delighted uh, and honoured to be on your podcast. It's great. Really looking forward to it. Good, good. Um, um, and uh, as, as we've just been talking beforehand, hopefully we'll uh, we we will navigate the sound engineering challenges that I've uh, that I've been uh, up against recently. And also, y- you have got uh, some sort of uh, construction work going on nearby. So hopefully we can uh, that we can we can sort of uh, struggle through and use it as a test of our resilience. Yeah, the uh, environmental restraints hopefully won't uh, kill our podcast, but uh, we'll try. We'll try. Tell the world all about you, Dan. Oh, wow. Okay, where do I start? So I'm a sports psychologist. I um, am a former pro golfer. Um, My love of sports psychology probably started actually in my my mid-teens. That's how sad I am, Stuart. Um, I, I picked up I think Timothy Galway's book at about the tender age of 15, 16, uh, the inner game of golf. It was Mm. an inner game of tennis, inner game of golf and became, I was playing a lot of golf at the time, amateur golf, um, sort of progressing sort of five from a five handicap to a three, two, one, et cetera, et cetera. So getting my handicap down and, and, uh, learning about every facet of the game. Um, and, um, I think I read also, I think my mother, uh, in an attempt to persuade me to have a backup to a golf career, bought me uh, an academic sports psychology book, I think by Deirdre Scully and John Kramer, who are a couple of academics in sports psychology. So that was, that was interesting and that was good. And, um, I turned, uh, professional as a golfer after leaving school at 18. Um, failed miserably as uh, a golfer, uh, in part due to a slight lack of ability, uh, in part uh, because uh, my mental game let me down. I was one of those golfers who stood on the first tee and looked left and looked right and worried about what was out there and looked at everybody else's swing and thought they were much better than me. Um, but also, interesting, Stuart, I think I, I was just always really interested in how to. You know, I was really into coaching and I was really into the mental side of the game and I picked up another book back in the mid 90s um, by Dr. Bob Rotella, Golf is Not a Game of Perfect and that proved to be tremendously influential, it actually helped my game, I actually won a little bit of money based off the back of some of his advice <laughs> um, but alas it wasn't, it wasn't to be impactful enough and um, so I, I started coaching golf uh, became a PGA pro and um, yeah it was kind of coaching the brilliant thing about coaching golf is you 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 get to coach the housewife and then you get to coach the doctor then the nurse and then the 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 lawyer and then the professional and then the junior and then you coach a bunch of juniors 106 year old kids or something in the driving range and for an hour and that's that's good fun and so you really get a range of experiences and uh coaching people from different sort of facets of life and different areas and stuff so so that's enormous fun and, and it really does help you 
So I was coaching golf and then I uh, loved sports psychology so much. I went to university, did a degree in psychology, did a master's degree in sports psychology and then was at a crossroads. Do I stay as a uh, golf coach and um, have the sports psychology as sort of on the side uh, or do I become a full time sports psychologist, um, become registered? be supervised etc etc so I chose the latter just because I wanted that rich range of experience across lots of sports and lots of different domains Um, and that's where I find myself now I've been doing that really to be honest I've been doing it for about 15 years now properly Um, the early years uh, corresponded with doing some golf coaching as well and um, now I find myself uh, I've been lead psych for England golf for three three years I left that a few years ago I'm now a lead psychologist for the England rugby senior team as they prepare for Japan 2019 the World Cup I'm a a psych at AFC Bournemouth in the English Premier League um, and I work with a range of sports people obviously I probably spend Specialising golf and football would be my main two, but I work across a range of sports. Work with coaches globally. I've, uh, as I said, I'm a sad anorak when it comes to this stuff. So I've written four books uh, where people can read my rambles about sports psych, and I have a new online soccer academy. So that's me, Stuart. Wow! And what do you do in the other 23 hours of the day? Uh, I, there, there are no other hours and, and my wife despairs she's very understanding and very kind to me um, as I as I bring sports psychology books to bed and all kinds of things so yeah it's uh, yeah I'm a sad man as I say well there's a danger here that we can uh, get into sad anorak world together because <laughs> One of the reasons I was so excited to have you on was because um, uh, this is a whole arena that um, <clears throat> on loads of levels um, that I'm absolutely fascinated by um, in the sense that I actually think this is the um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's the missing link in in talent development, um, in coaching of young people. I firmly believe that um, that this is the bit that coaches need to spend much, much more time developing their their capabilities within because uh, we're in the business of helping to unleash young people's potential. Um, we know that the journey towards improvement is going to be one that is uh, challenging, is difficult. Um, we know that uh, one of the things that's going to help them navigate that challenging, difficult journey is their ability uh, mentally to cope with the demands, not only of the competition, but the demands of everything else that goes around being, you know, an aspiring elite athlete. And yet, in my opinion, um, I used to go around the the country. I would um, do workshops with coaches, talent coaches, talent breakfast clubs, they were called. I reckon I spoke to, let's say, about 500 coaches in in a period of a year. And I would ask the same question. How important is the area of psychology to the development of talented athletes? They would all say it's extremely important. How much training have you had in it? And all the hands would go down. Maybe you would stay up. And so for my, my in my mind, I'm saying, well, maybe there's an area for us to all go out there and get some more education in. Because if we're genuinely passionate about helping people to develop, we probably need to get a bit more skilled up in this. So um, really interested to sort of, you know, hear more about the work you do, how you do it. And, and, and also, you know, um, any sort of nuggets of information that uh, coaches can, can uh, you know, take on board. And, and you know what, just to interject there, Stuart, I, I, uh, I love what you've just said because it's my passion as well to introduce um, this stuff to coaches, to players. And, uh, you know, for me, the start of helping players mentally um, begins in the coach's own mind in terms of the the structure they have for their coaching or the schematic they have for their coaching how do they approach their coaching you know if you take the say the four corner fa four corner model and the four corner model the the technical the physical the the uh, psychological social corners um look it's 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 a good model um it's a model used across most sports and it, i'm not saying it's a bad model and um i for one think some of the stuff the fa doing are doing now you know i listen to a lot of your podcasts with nick levette 
um, who's outstanding, and a lot of the stuff John Allpress has brought to it. So much good stuff. But I, 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 I'm probably in a position where I sit outside uh, of, say, something like the FA, and I can look at that model and I go, is that really, is that really true, this four-corner model? Is that really the most effective way for a coach to see – the coaching process and you know I, I i drive along and i listen to your um, podcast and other podcasts and i i'm always getting an image in my mind of what you are talking about with um people so i i, I would sort of say here you know for listeners to think about that four corner model and really ask themselves is this the most effective way or as a suggestion just a suggestion do we actually need to deconstruct that model I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just, I wonder if it's optimal. Do we need to deconstruct that model and say, okay, look, there's, there's the technical side, there's the, the physical side, there's the tactical side. And, and denying those is like denying the sun and the moon and the sky. They're there, they exist. Okay, we have some debates about what technique is and we can have that in the next hour or so. But for me, if I deconstruct that model, I think I take the psych and the social sides and I take them out of a corner model and, and I say they drive. So if people can picture psych, social underneath the technical, physical and tactical sides with arrows pointing up and probably arrows pointing back down. For me, psych, the psych social model, which is something I'm building on. Psychosocial drives the technical, drives the tactical, drives the physical side of the game. And I, I, I uh, think that coaches should sit down when they're doing their session plans, when they're doing their uh, reviews, uh, but especially when they're doing their session plans. You know, think about the psychosocial side. Put learning first. Put your players first. Put yourself in their boots. Uh, or their shoes. Um, how do they best? How do how do how do people learn? How do I help these players learn? Um, how can I uh, deliver a session that helps players feel good? That helps them feel more confident. That helps them um, battle with the struggles that they might they might have in certain in- instances. How can I help them? Um, work better with teammates how what's my communication going to be like in this session where do i have to be directive where might i be more non-directive i could go on obviously Stuart, but that that's kind of a good i think a good starting point with the conversation is for i might be an i might be taking an extreme point of view here but how about coaches putting psychosocial first not the X's and the O's, not what activity am I going to do, but if I, if I am going to think about the activity, what, this, what, did, what are the psychosocial demands of this activity? For me, those need to come first. I, uh, I, I entirely agree, um, and I, I don't think it's actually that, um, that extreme at all. In fact, it's, a, it's actually a long overdue way of thinking about, um, about how we develop people. Um, so, for example, you know, any any coach can develop a session that that uh, challenges resilience um, or develops resilience. You know, yep. coaches can can very deliberately, if they want to. Um, you know, we talked. I talked a lot um, in my last podcast with with Lauren Anderson around uh, this whole idea of trauma. You know, and the, the idea of of uh, traumatic experience and overcoming challenge being being an important part of the learning journey within talent. We're not saying it's essential, but we're saying it's a pretty important part. And so, developing those coping skills uh, are really important to drive the tactical. I use your I use your example right at the start. Actually, you know, you were one of those people who because you didn't have the psychological tools, stood on first tee looking left and right. And as Kendall McQuay, one of my favourite lines, Kendall McQuay says, which is, you know, you, you were operating somewhere between hope and fear. Yep. Now, you, if you have some tools that you can provide and help people to develop, and it's like any other skill, a mental skill, then you're not operating between hope and fear. Because actually, you're, you're building a bubble of resilience. And sorry, just to finalise, finalize, you mentioned Bob Rotella. By the way, what a what a fantastic book. Um, I've read nearly everything he's written. Uh, I met the man once, fortunately, on the uh, on the practice ground of the um, uh, of the uh, uh, the Open Championship. I think it might have been Hoylake. 
Um, just dropping a few names in. But anyway, <laughs> one of the things I was going to say was, is that that book also transformed my game. Um, I went from a frustrated 12 handicapper to a um, really quite content seven handicapper, largely oh. through some of the lessons that, that Bob teaches, which is, and I, I describe it as almost creating this kind of bubble of resilience um, where you're able to cope with the challenges and stresses that the game of golf throws at you. Um, and before I had that, I was just this horrible person on a golf course and I didn't actually enjoy the game. Um, and, and actually it's transformed not only my participation, but also my performance. So this is, you know, it's like a no brainer for me Oh, to use a bad metaphor, but there we go. I, I, th- I think, uh, you know, as you're talking now, I'm thinking and, and my day to day job, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious coming on this podcast that there, there are a lot of coaches. Obviously, there will be some working at an elite level, but many not. So I'm going to try and make this as across the board as I can, because a lot of my work is at the elite level. But, you know, I, I'm. It, it, first thing which, which I think is really interesting is the stuff that you're talking about every week. As I say, I'm in the car, I'm venturing down to Bournemouth or over to Penny Hill Park with England Rugby or wherever. All of this stuff is relevant to my day there. All of this stuff, putting psychosocial first is relevant to coaches at the very or managers at the very elite level. It really, really is right the way through to coaches who are coaching uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year olds. You know, uh, person first, player second, performance third, in my opinion. And actually at the elite level, if you make it person, um, uh, player performance in that order, actually you get better outcomes, in my opinion. It's, it's an interesting equation. But, you know, coming back to what you were talking about with Bob Retainer and helping your golf, for me, one of the things I'm constantly doing, and I'm doing it with coaches of younger age groups, maybe from sort of 14, 15, where competitiveness is starting to become more to the fore, is how do players, young players, older players alike, define competitiveness? And quite often they define it just as it's a performance. I want to perform well. I want to be man of the match. Obviously, I want to win, for instance. That's competitiveness. That's how people define competitiveness. You know, words matter, sentences, phrases matter. Actually, and I find myself doing this, my, it's, it's just my opinion, Stuart, but competitiveness is performance and mindset. So when you sat down and you read a Bob Rotella book, for me, there's potentially a shift in your brain from when I go on a golf course, I'm trying to play my best game to when I go on the golf course, I'm trying to play my best game and I'm trying to get the best from my play. So it's a performance and a mindset. So when I work with golfers of all ages, I'm helping and footballers and, and rugby players. Um, I'm trying to help them understand that competitive competitiveness is I want to perform and I want to perform really well. I want to have a 10 out of 10 performance. So in golf, I want to play my A game. But the reality is, is that to be able to do that, I've got to manage my mindset. I've got to manage the distractions that will, it will inevitably happen. I've got to ha- uh, manage that moment of adversity that might reduce my confidence slightly. Hey, I've got to manage my mood. You know what most coaches say to me? The toughest challenge is, um, is that when my players turn up and they say, I'm not feeling it today, coach. I'm, I, mood and motivation tend to be real mediators. So by helping players manage the mood and manage their motivation, manage their mindset, that makes an enormous difference to their performance. So for me, Monday to Friday for a performance on Saturday, there has to be an element of how do I help my players manage their mindset? How do I help them become more competent at managing their mindset? Absolutely. And um, and I think the, the thing about that is um, most it's one of those things where it's really difficult, isn't it? Because um, it's it's not uh, it's almost a bit counterintuitive because it's not you, you don't you almost can't develop the cap the, the the skills <laughs> without the experience alongside it. You know, it's almost like saying you know trying to teach somebody to you know giving somebody some tools in case they need them in the future. Well, actually, it's not really that good an, you know a good way of developing it. What you want to do is you want to actually you know to become a, a crafts or a craft person with anything you know you, you kind of have to you have to do it 
as well as learn the school, learn the skills at the same time. So that experiential learning model from a psychological skills development, I would adopt. I think it's the same. It's contextualized learning. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that you would you, you use a similar approach. Yeah, look, I, I, I think when do you start? Uh, if I understand what you're saying, I understand your question. When do you start helping players learn how to manage their mindset? When do you help them uh, start to learn mental skills? And I personally think it can can it happen from the very first time they pick up a, a club or a bat or a um, tennis racket. Um, not in a particularly overt way, not in a let's sit down and let's learn about self-talk here. Let's sit down and learn about, I don't know, um, uh, um, individual zones of optimal functioning. Clearly, you don't want to do that at eight years old, and I'm not saying that. <laughs> but if we if, if we take, okay, and this is, this is my real passion, Stuart, so we can take a term like individual zone of optimal functioning. Hey, that's a really cool term, isn't it? Or ideal performance state. Well, you know what? You can help an eight-year-old start to develop that without telling them. Because if you ask them, I'm going to give you an example. And it's, it's just a generic example. You've got a young footballer, eight, nine, ten years old. Young footballers love um, elite footballers. They have heroes. They want to be Lionel Messi. They want to be Neymar. Rightly or wrongly, that's what they want. Okay. Or they, or at least they love watching them and looking at them and they love to emulate them, Stuart. Yeah. So just by asking, okay, who's your favorite player? Okay. Uh, who's your favorite boy? Well, it's, it's Messi. Okay. Show me what Messi looks like. Go and show me what Messi looks like here. So how does he stand? How does he hold himself? Um, how does he run? Okay. If he makes a mistake, what does he do then? What do you think he does? What do you think he does? And then, then you can actually start playing about with some words, Stuart, I think, I, uh, because uh, words are powerful. Words open up pictures. So if you ask a 10, 11, 12-year-old, um, tell, me, tell me what your best football looks like. Tell me about that. Well, what are you doing? What if there was a camera on you? What would I see? I'm going to give you some words. Um, upbeat, strong, powerful, aggressive, um, confident, tall. You can guarantee a young footballer can give you a word. Now, put that word in front of Messi. So let's say it's confident Messi. Show me confident Messi. Show me confident Messi. If you give that ball away, I want you to run back confident Messi. Okay, I want you to show everybody confident Messi. I want you to go back home and tell mum and dad how much fun you had being confident Messi because this is all about fun. So what are you doing there? You are training individual zone of optimal functioning. You're training ideal performance state. You're tra training a challenge state. So for me, it can start very early. It's just how do you do it? And that, you know, uh, I know you've read one of my golf books, uh, uh, golf tough you know in my other books soccer tough and soccer tough too that that's really what i'm passionate about is trying to bring alive the uh, academic side in a simple possible way um so that coaches and young people can become excited about doing these kind of things and you know what's really interesting Stuart is the guys at the very top the tw guys in your mid-20s who's who are multi-millionaires they need it like that as well not because they're daft not because they're dumb but because sport is so complex that they just need simple ideas so I have clients going out on Saturday and they'll be trying to trying to be confident, relentless lion, which is a great pic pictorial metaphor. I might have I've got one who's going out and is trying to unleash Carragher hell. <laughs> and you know why he's trying to unleash Carragher hell, Stuart? Because I asked him about his very best game. That's one of the greatest questions any coach can ask a player. Tell me about you at your best and elicit great words from them. Great pictures, great memories. Memory, fantastic tool in your toolbox as a coach. And asking this player, he said, I'll tell you, I'll tell you when it was. It was when I played Liverpool and Jamie Carragher was a defender and halfway through the second half, Jamie Carragher turned around to me and said, would you stop moving? He actually said it a bit more explicit than that, but I'm not going to use those words. But he said, would you stop moving? And, and, and we, 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 we frame that as unleashing Carragher hell. So whenever I see that player, 
you're going to unleash Carragher hell. That's what you're going to do. It's a great metaphor. It creates great pictures. Great pictures create great feelings. Great feelings, you know, he can, that player can go on the pitch and can shape himself into that form of, I'm going to unleash Carragher hell, which I think is really interesting when it comes to, say, the work of Amy Cuddy with her power poses, which I know has had some criticism, perhaps, for the, the, the ability to replicate the studies that she's done. But what I like about that notion of power pose, what I like about that notion of physiology driving psychology, physiology driving behavior, is that body language isn't just keep great body language it's i'm going to shape myself into somebody or into something i'm going to shape myself into a memory of how i was when i was at my best or imagination who i want to be and that's what i'm going to do and that helps you manage your focus it helps you deal with distractions it helps you play efficacious with confidence so um i think that's my long-winded answer to your questions Joe. <laughs> yeah i mean and I love it though. I mean, I love the fact that you know, even with uh, children in in a very you know, like you say, non-interventionist way, m- more playful. Yeah. You, know, you you get them to either emulate their heroes or adopt manner mannerisms or behaviours that they deem to be appropriate, and in so doing, they're essentially learning to manage their state in the simplest possible way. Absolutely. And you know what's really, really interesting is that some of the best in the world do this. And, and, and because, OK, take your your friend, mentor, a guy you've had on the pod a couple of times, Mark Bennett. I don't know Mark. I've known of his work. Take somebody like Dr. Dave Arred, who's obviously done great work with Johnny Wilkinson and Luke Donald, helped Luke Donald get to world number one. You, you hear it repeatedly from them. You know, um, Mark talks about performance being behavior. Dave Arred, I believe, and I don't want to do him a disservice here by misquoting him, so please forgive me, but he talks about skill being behavior. And I'm often sitting with coaches and talking about performance psychology being behavior. It's just behavior. And one of the most powerful things coaches can, 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 can do on the training pitch, you know, no matter what activity it is, is show me confidence. Show me confidence, you know, just show me that body language. It's just a behavior. And the more you help players become acquainted with that behavior, and it is just a way of being, then um, the, 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 the more chance you've got of helping them ingrain it. So it really does go hand in hand with some of the things you've discussed on previous pro, uh, podcasts. Yeah, and um, it's it's an area that I definitely have more. I'm going to have more conversations like this with people because, like I said, it's an area of particular per- per- personal interest. Interestingly, um, I'm reading a book at the moment, um, uh, which is talks about um, actually interestingly some of Amy Cuddy's work around embodied cognition, um, which I'm very interested in the idea. I mean, it's it's linked to flow states in particular, but I'm very interested in the idea of you know essentially how there is an increasing amount of research that is beginning to suggest that this idea of the mind and the body being separate and the mind kind of drives the body, actually, what they're saying is, is it's far more complex than that. And actually, physiology drives mood or drives motivational state. Yeah. Um, so you're, you can ostensibly physically place yourself into a different motivational state um, by acting and in, and kind of carrying yourself in the world in a certain way. And people don't sort of think that. They think it's the brain regulating the behavior. It doesn't always have to work that way. I think it's really interesting. And, and I think it's really important to say here, use the term, it's a term I use a lot, uh, the, the difference between simple and easy. And, and what you're saying here and what I'm saying are, are, sound very simple, but they're really not easy to do. And, and sort of a story from my own playbook or my own experience is that as a pro golfer, if I had about 10 people watching me, I was terrified, Stuart. I really was. I felt, I, I just felt the burden. I've, I remember the 1998 British Open final qualifying and I teed it up with Barry Lane, who um, had a great career, had been in the world's top 50 at one stage and another golfer. And it was kind of the stellar draw, if anything. I was very lucky to get that draw because I really was only a local pro golfer. And I was terrified. We had about a thousand people watching and I just spent four hours shaking, you know, and, and, and 
But here's the interesting thing. So last year, for instance, I went to Poland and I delivered a presentation to a thousand um, Eastern Europeans. So my Polish isn't what it should be. So clearly um, it was translated. Right. But I, I was in front of a thousand Eastern, and I loved it. I absolutely love it. I love presenting to an audience. I, I, you know, I don't know if it feeds my ego or whatever, but I just love sports psychology. I love presenting to an audience. But give me a golf club. Give me a motor skill. And I crumble. And um, I, I know that sounds very absolute. I, I'm sure I could help myself get better at it. So what I'm trying to say is, is the stuff you're talking about, I think that it's very easy to – it's very simple to talk about it. And um, – and and people might dismiss it um but it's not easy to do for people and um under pressure whether that's playing for an under 13 team and you're playing in a match that's really important to you as a kid whether that's playing in the world cup final if you're a rugby player um in japan in a couple of years time these things matter you know, uh, embodied cognition will matter for some players, but um, it matters on Saturday in the Premier League for some players. It, it, it's going to be an important thing for them to do to deal with the pressure, uh, and it's not necessarily going to be easy for them to do it. So, um, yeah, I, I think just making sure people understand, simple but not easy. Yeah, you, you, you're making me think of, um, I mean, a number of different things. I mean, one of the things that um, you know, Mark Bennett, you know taught me i suppose is you know if you want players to be able to cope with the demands of a high pressure situation uh, like 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 a match or a game or something like that then the training needs to emulate that yep. if anything the training probably needs to be more severe and so the use of consequence and that consequence can be in, can make, can take many forms i um remember coaching my um I was coaching a ladies team and they're playing at probably the equivalent, I suppose, of like in footballing terms, sort of the Vauxhall Conference. That what was the Vauxhall Conference. I think it's called the Betfair, whatever now. Um, but, you know, decent standard. And um, and I was coaching them and we, didn't, and, and we created a game where we had a, a forfeit um, and they chose the forfeit. And the forfeit was they had to sing a song to the opponents, to their, to the opposition. They're, they're, mm-hmm. you know, the, of, and you wouldn't believe the level of intensity and the level of pressure that created the fact that they would have to and we we said we would film it and put it on facebook and everything else so we we heightened up the level of humiliation um but just something like that that they chose as a potential consequence and then the intensity that they then play at and then we can talk about how they feel how how it felt when they were playing in with that level of pressure what the uh, what the challenges were did it affect the way they made decisions did it affect them were they able to still see things or did they become more constrained in their thinking and those things then translate into markedly different performances when you come up against, you know, teams that are going to give you some 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 hard times. And those are the sorts of things I think that coaches can do way more of. But that's because the starting point for me was how do I help my players deal with pressure? And I designed the session around that. Goes back to your point at the start. Forget the starting point with what do I want them to be able to do? I want them to be able to pass better. Actually, no, I want them to be able to manage their state when under pressure. And we're going to use a game that involves passing or whatever it might be, but with some other constraints attached to it so that we can help them start to navigate this landscape themselves. You know, it's interesting as you're talking, I'm thinking of um, I'm going back to England under 18 girls golf team. And we did something similar with the singing. I mean, singing's great because it's it's such a source of stress, isn't it? I feel I'm being judged, yeah. you know, really comes in there and, and um, none of them wanted to lose. And so we went out for 18 holes and boy Stuart did they play slow I mean it was it mirrored how they were in the tournament and and actually saying they played slow is is an interesting one because it that's what they did is that they they tended to play their best golf when they played mates golf yeah. and you see this in every sport especially at the elite level um and actually as as, as a as a game face I call it a game face I've worked with elite footballers and said you've got to go and play, go out and play mates football you know because you're you're putting far too much pressure on yourself which i'm going to park and come back to in a minute because it's an area i find fascinating but we went out and we played this game and, and the girls would play 
better quicker stick to a process stick to their routine manage their manage their mindset post shot every single shot but they played so slow and uh, after about five or six holes and we're literally about two hours in i've only played five or six holes stop right okay everyone can we play quicker can we play just play mates golf the way that you are going to want you to stick to the process but Let's just play like we played mates golf. And, and they started to compete uh, so much better. They started to – their performance got better. Their shots got better. They hit more A shots. They got the ball in the hole quicker, right? Um, so it's amazing what a bit of pressure does. For some, it slows you down. For others, it speeds you up. For some, it takes you out of the process in golf, away from your routine. You'll hit shots on bad thoughts. You'll be indecisive, et cetera, et cetera. So – but be playing those kind of games, uh, putting putting players under pressure, and giving them the opportunity to practice the process is absolutely imperative. Um, and and coming back to you know training and and training at the right intensity, you know I, I, I think that what's become very interesting lately for me is this idea of paradoxical thinking and and this idea that players in all sports tend to um they tend to train um train too lightly i'm talking about elite level here train too lightly and come match day they're too hard on themselves they want it too much quite often does that make sense yeah. and actually it requires a reverse it requires uh i think players are far better being more intense before training and more relaxed before match day and i find myself working on that they need more stretch before training and during training they meet, need more support before and on uh, and during match day and, on, and during the match, if that makes sense. So um, I, I, I kind of I'm interested if you read my tweets, I'm really into something called Janusian thinking, which right. is paradoxical thinking, which is this notion. Well, there's a lot of paradoxical things in uh, sporting performance, but less is more. I compete at a three out of 10 intensity level. I support myself more and that helps me to perform better. Does that make sense? Or am I going off on an apps too much of a tangent here? Tell me. No, no, I totally agree. I, it, it's interestingly, it's one of the things that I'm constantly doing um, with the players, you know, I asking that question, what, what, where are we out of 10? Yeah. Where is our focus and our intensity here out of 10, you know, and they'll go around the table, they'll go around in three, four, whatever. And I'm going, where do you think it ought to be? You know, 10, right. How do we get to 10? Yep. What's going to get us to 10? Um, well, we need to do that and we need to make it look like that. We need to, okay, let's get to that. We, the, and this goes back to Mark Bennett's rule of three. The, the minute we recognise that we're not there, we call it out. If I have to intervene that we're not there, that's that's the last thing, you know. So if I have to intervene, then we know that we're going to have a, another conversation. But it's about maintaining the, like I said, focus, intensity, uh, it's not always just about effort. It's actually about effort with the right level of um, mental uh, fo- uh, mental sort of um, focus, what a better <laughs> phrase. Um, I don't just want them to run around like maniacs. They've got to be running around, but they've got to be purposeful. It's got to be mindful training. You know, I use this phrase quite a lot. Just just going back to what you were saying there about, uh, you know, a mark out of 10, um, scaling, I think, is uh, is one tool I use quite often. It's something coaches can become a lot better at. Uh, scaling is a tool often used in something called solution-focused brief therapy, which I urge anybody listening, go on Google. Google solution-focused brief therapy. Take yourself on the course. They are fantastic. It is full of fantastic practical pragmatic tools for coaches and scaling is one so helping the point of scaling is it helps uh, clarify where somebody is now and i'll give you an example in a minute where somebody is now and maybe how they can get towards a desired goal so and this works really well i find for confidence so if i'm sitting in front of somebody who is who's come to me or has been sent to me because they're lacking a bit of confidence from a very basic perspective here 
okay, so give me a mark out of 10 for confidence, with 10 being you are so awesomely confident, it's just unreal, nor or one out of 10, you are just, you want to give up the game type thing. And what you often find is a player will, will who's lacking confidence will say, well, I'm really lacking confidence right now, Phew, down at five. Five, fantastic. Okay, why as high as five? Why not three? Tell me more. Tell me why as high as five. What's going on right now that's really working for you? And actually, so that's the start of scaling. That's one way to use scaling. Actually, you're kind of reframing within the scale because somebody who comes to you is lacking confidence. They're kind of like, no, it's five. It's so low. Everything's terrible. Woe is me. I'm doing everything wrong. So and you're like saying, actually, can we actually pick out points in the last few weeks that have gone well? Why, why not three? Why five? And getting them to try to uncover the little things that have been going well so that you can use those as evidence during your session to help them build their confidence. That's called a counter in solution-focused brief therapy. But here's the pragmatic tool with it as well, as you alluded to earlier. Okay, you're at five. What does what does six look like? Or what does seven look like? Not, perhaps not what 10 looks like because that's probably too big a leap. What does six look like? Um, and, and just asking them to uncover some ideas, get them to use their imagination. What does six look like? Well, I'm on my toes a bit more and I'm being a bit, bit more decisive with my crosses and I'm taking shots a bit earlier or, uh, I'm in golf. I'm, I'm swinging a bit more freely and I'm getting a real good shoulder turn. And so, okay. Right. How can we get to six? What practical steps can you do that's going to help you get to six and then to seven and so on and so forth? So confidence doesn't feel like we can use scaling to help players build self-efficacy, confidence, um, by using scaling. And you, it, it, it suddenly doesn't become this, whoa, what, does conf- what is confidence? What does it mean? Confidence means different things for different people. And by using scaling, you using that inductive process you're inducing the answer from them by asking them the right questions you can really help a player in that way brilliant i think um I, i've just been i'm gonna have to, have to look i'll put a link in around solution focus brief therapy that's <laughs> definitely going to be my next uh, my next area of, of personal development i like i like the sound of that um you've made me think of something actually that um i was i, I do quite a bit um and have done with teams in the past as well, which was something you linked to earlier on, which is um, I actually get them to, uh, which usually actually I, it's stimulated by, we, we'll, we'll have a meltdown. And it, quite often it happens for, you know, usually in a, at least once a season, there'll be a period in the, in the, the season where we have a meltdown. And, um, you know, everything falls to pieces and you completely, you know, every, you just, as a coach, you just, you, there's nothing you can do. And the more you try, to do things, you know, and change things and all these sorts of things, the, the worse it gets. So you just have to ride through it. But then what I'll do is I'll use that meltdown and then that'll be a, usually a turning point in a season because I will then say, right, in the, ne- the next time we have a kind of, and I did this as my pre-match talk, we got together, said, right, last week, just describe it for me. Describe how it felt. Describe um, what it looked like. Was it you know, was it in colour? Was it in black and white? Was it, um, and I got this stuff from Jamie Edwards, Train Brain, who I know you probably will have come across in the past. Uh, yeah. You work, in, you work in the same sort of space. Yeah. Um, and um, I did a course with him for three days, went on a retreat to the, um, uh, I think I might have mentioned this before, but we went on a retreat to the Lake District. So I did that and it was, I bought it as a, I sort of, a, it was a, my Christmas present to my, my staff when I was working at the RFU. I think they, not quite sure how they took that as a Christmas present. However, um, it did. It really helped to forge us as a team, and we all got a real sense of who we were and what we were trying to do. So it was a really, really fantastic, transformative experience. Um, but it, one of the things that I learned from him was this idea of so let, let's just relive that that whole thing and how it felt and what did it look like and what are we doing. And I wrote wrote it all down on the whiteboard and all these words. I said, right, that's our worst. That's us at our worst. And we gave it a colour and I think they called it red. And I think the the um uh the all blacks do something similar, don't they? And then I said, right, let's let's now let's talk about the opposite. So let's think about when we're absolutely at our best when we're doing everything and it's flowing and everything. And I've got to throw the words out and how it felt and what it looked like and all these sorts of things. 
And I said, right, what colour? What are we going to call that? And they, they called that blue, I think. But the rest of the season, that I heard them on the pitch saying, stay in the blue, stay in the blue. And <laughs> and we won. We won the league. Now, I'm not saying it was to do with that, but I, I feel personally that without that sort of essentially traumatic experience, which we were then able to use and learn from to create our worst and best, I don't know if we'd have necessarily got to where we'd have got to. And I, and I think, wow, there's so much to say about what you've just said. I don't even know where to start, actually. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go on a Billy Connolly tangent in loads of different directions here. So um, uh, I'm thinking clear, concise, controllable goals developed for your group from memory from you guys at your best that's a massive thing for teams get your team together get your players together um be non-directive empower them ask them the quest ask them the question and it's holding an appreciative inquiry appreciative inquiry is another one of the solution focused brief therapy things here so ask them okay so when we are at our best, what does that look like? What does that feel like? What would, what do we do? But you've got to get them to try and break it down to clear, concise, controllable goals. And when I say you've got to get them to do this, what I'm saying is that don't give them the answers. They've got to come up with the answers. Your team have to be empowered to take ownership, take responsibility. It's their team, right? Uh, but if you just ask them to think about two or three matches this season when we've been at our best, okay, tell me about that. What behaviours? There's a camera on us. What do what have people seen? What have we done? You know, and they'll come up with things like uh, positive vocals, great body language, quick passing, whatever it is, whatever it is. But your your help, you've got to help them break it down into three or four or five clear, concise, controllable goals. So it can't be something that the opposition have to do. It can't be something that's heavily influenced from the outside. It's got to be what we can do again mark bennett behaviors they're going to be behaviors that we can do and as you said there's a real cool thing you did with jamie there which is you you labeled it something whether it's blue whether it's black whether it's green whether it's unleashed carragher hell whether it's you know um 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 cheltenham united um i shouldn't use cheltenham that's a proper team uh <laughs> whoever whoever united right it it, it, it doesn't it, it you just got to get them to come up with their answers. Clearly lost my train of thought there, Stuart. You see, I'm going off on loads of tangents here, but I, I, I think that um, getting – so clear, concise, controllable goals is really important, and that's whether it's for the individual or for the group or for the team, and it sounds like the retreat there really, really helped you. Yeah, it's interesting because I think this is one of the things I think that people sort of struggle with. There's a, a good friend of mine, actually, who's um, taken a, a sort of new job with a, a really top, top team. Um, and he came to me before the season started and he was sort of saying, my worry with this group is they're really good. And the problem is they have it easy and we're not going to be able to manage um and, you know, we're not going to be able to deal with adversity and it's not going to, it's going to help us because, you know, they generally speaking will, will, will do OK. And then um, and he said, but, you know, I know we're going to have a t some tough games and I want to get them ready for that. So I, I recommended for him something that I learned from Dave Allred, funnily enough, um, where he talks about he talks a lot about, you know, dislocated expectations and stuff. He, so the stuff he was doing with Clive Woodward's uh, World Cup winning side, um, <laughs> you know, around actually making creating deliberate scenarios where the players have to manage and um so what i suggested that he would do i don't know if he did it was he deliberately created like the worst game day ever so what he what he did was you know like the minibus wouldn't be booked and they'd have to you know get one last minute or go in cars or or, or the minibus would break down um, you know, just beforehand, they'd have to like run the final mile. They'll be late. He'll be really grouchy. Um, you know, uh, very different from how he would normally act. Normally quite laid back, quite chilled out. He'd be really, really moody and grouchy. You know, somebody, the goalkeeper won't arrive with their kit and they'll come in last minute. And so to create the worst day ever and then use that as a learning experience. Um, because I just don't know if we do enough of that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And, 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 uh, well, uh, I, I, 
uh, as you know, I'm involved with England rugby, and, and as you know, I can't say too much about it. But that's I, what I can say because he's on record as saying it is that Eddie Jones does a lot around chaos, which uh, you know, um, putting the resp- creating some chaos and putting the responsibility on players to be able to deal with that. Now, obviously, that's at the very elite level, but you can do that at young younger uh, levels, obviously in the most ethical and, and uh, pragmatic way um, possible. Um, but I, I, my response to that is, is I think if even if even if you can't practically do like do something like that, um, the other tool that's heavily used in my toolbox is imagination. So you know, going back to your original story of you know a fellow coach said you know this this team have had it so easy and I know that they're, they're going to be up against some adversity. Um, one thing you can do is exactly what Dave Alwyn said there which is actually create some problems and and help them deal with those problems or get them to deal with those problems and that's what eddie jones is doing the other way is just to use your imagination get the group together come up with hypothesize some challenges that they might have going a goal down going three goals down our best player uh, is ill uh, the pitch is horrendous the referees making awful decisions again talking about certain levels here um how are we going to deal with that um um, how are you going to react and respond? How are we going to help each other? And, uh, and just facilitating a process whereby the group brainstorms and fitting some of the ideas that they come up with into your training sessions. I, I, I really think you can do that with, with younger age levels. I, I, I think that, you know, you can, you can use that idea. So I think you can, you can create chaos in your sessions and that's probably the most practical way of doing it, but you can also help players use their imagination. As I say, as a psychologist, I've got three tools, three major tools in my toolbox, memory, percept, memory, imagination, and perception. Memory, what does my best game look like? What do I do when I do it really good? What do we do when we do it really good? Imagination, you know, if this happens, what are we going to do? How are we going to deal with it? How do other teams deal with it, you know? Um, so I, I think those are really practical tools. Brilliant. Um, one of the things I was going to ask you about, actually, was um, in the work that you've done over the years, I mean, you know, your, your books like, uh, and you're quite right, I mean, I've not only read Golf Tough, but um, actually used large parts of it to help me write um, an athlete development framework for um, for the Qatari Olympic Commission. Um, so, uh, yeah, you're referenced in there. Um, but, yeah, no, it was a really, a really great and very usable, and it's a well-worn book that's on my... Um, on my bookshelf um but in there you know a lot of people i think what they assume is that you're talking a lot about you know like for example because it's called golf tough is obviously about resilience mental toughness all these sorts of things these are important things to develop in young people i'm slightly concerned that um there is a bit of a generational thing happening with young people whereby uh, sort of not provided with challenge enough in life and therefore almost don't respond very well when they're presented with, say, some negative feedback or or something that's, uh, you know, challenging them. And so I actually believe it's it's uh, almost like a moral obligation of mine as a talent coach trying to help them unleash their potential to pr- 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 provide the right point of challenge for them so that they can actually learn something about themselves. Now, wherever they go in their sporting career is obviously going to help them, but it also helps them in other aspects of their of their daily life. And I get slightly concerned that we're not we're not doing enough of this with young people and we're sort of avoiding it for fear of uh, creating undesirable consequences. But I think it's an important element that we need to we need to foster. Absolutely. And before I answer that question, uh, I'll thank you very much for sharing my work with the Qatari, whichever <laughs> association it was, since it's Qatar yeah. and they have piles of cash. Uh, I'll, I'll enjoy receiving some royalties from you, uh, Stu. I'm sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, I, I, look, I, I, clearly I agree with you. And, and I think that the way I see it like this is whenever I describe what I do as a sports psychologist, one of the first the kind of kind of definitions I go to is, is is this notion of I'm a stretch and I'm a support. Uh, I'm a stretch and I'm a support. And I, I think look, at the end of the day, as a sports psychologist, the reality is you're a coach. I'm a coach, right? And it's just a coach of psychology. Um, and um, 
I'm a stretch, I'm a support, and all coaches are stretches and supports. And they've, and for me, great coaching is being flexible and robust between stretch and support. If people can picture a continuum from st- maybe stretch on the right hand, right hand side, support on the left hand side. So, but by stretch, if I was defo- to, to kind of define stretch, it would be, um, Helping players experience an environment where they've, they've, uh, they're coming out their comfort zone. They're visiting the ugly zone, as David Holred would say. Yeah. Um, they're, they're uncomfortable, right? Um, and a support is whether it's, uh, direct, directly verbally, uh, uh, communicatively, uh, offering support or whether it's, uh, empowering a player by helping them learn, say, a psychological strategy to support themselves. That's kind of where I am with, with, with support. And you've got this continuum. And, and actually, a good way to see this is, is, I know you used this analogy the other week. I can't remember which podcast it was, but um, I use this all the time in terms of volume. You know, as a coach, and, and I think the interesting thing here is this works across all levels – You've got to turn up and down your dials, your volume dials of the volume of stretch and the volume of support. And I think great coaching, if you want to call it world class coaching, however you want to describe it, is being robust enough, good enough, um, flexible enough to know when to turn up the volume of stretch, when to turn down the volume of stretch, when to turn up the volume of support, when to turn down the volume of support. uh, when to do that, for whom to do that with, to do that with a set of it, to, to, to do that with an individual, to do that with a group of players. How, you know, how, that's hard, isn't it, Sure, That's hard to do, especially when you're coaching a team. But you, you've got to be able to do that. And, and you, you might have a young team, you might have a, a group of 13 year olds, and you might make a decision that, you know what, in this training session, I'm really going to turn up the volume of stretch. So you do something uh, within the environment or with your uh, voice or, or, or whatever it is to turn up that volume of stretch. You make it harder for them. Um, perhaps you make it so hard that you know they're going to be incapable of doing it effectively. But in that way, gives you the opportunity to help them turn up the volume of support um, because they're so stretched. You've kind of got a 10 out of 10 on your dials of, of stretch and 10 out of 10 on the dial of support. And then you might turn down the volume of dials. Am I making sense there? I'm kind of hoping people can picture that. I think great coaches are able to do both, whether it's um, teaching players how to support themselves or supporting them through that, through your voice, uh, whether that's, um, creating stretch through your voice or whether that's creating an, an, an environment of stretch, you've got to turn up and down that volume of, of, of support and stretch. I, I, uh, I, I think that, and that's ultimately growth, isn't it? Um, yes. You know, helping people with behavior change in whatever kind of walk of life. And, you know, a big part of what I do day to day, day job wise is around you know, helping people become more active or go from you know, being chronically inactive towards becoming more active. And I think that, in my opinion, anyway, you know, coaches have got a very important role to play there in helping people go from, uh, you know, uh, changing their behavior from an inactive lifestyle towards an active lifestyle. I think changing behavior in any case is a really difficult proposition. But what you've described there of stretch and support is a brilliant way of almost summarizing, in my opinion, kind of how human growth happens. You challenge people. They try and solve the problem. You support them to solve the problem. You challenge them again. Absolutely. And, and, and yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I, this, I see this at my consultancy uh, at the very top level, uh, say England Rugby, Bournemouth, uh, other elite players. And uh, I, I, I see it done well at academies. Uh, I see that it can be done better at, at academy level as well. 
Um, but it comes back to our very first thing that we said about psychosocial. Stretch and support for me comes under the banner of psychosocial. I urge coaches, or at least I, I don't urge coaches, I, I, I propose that coaches sit down with their planner when they're thinking about the activities that they want to put in place and they think, okay, where can I put some stretch in here? You know, it might be done overtly. It might be done implicitly. And again, it might be done through their voice. It might be done through the environment. Um, how can I support my players? Can I say something to them at the beginning of the session that might help them to support themselves in this session that I'm going to put a lot of stretch into. So, for instance, I might ask them at the beginning of the session, might take 30 seconds to say, OK, I want you to think about you at your best today. Just get a picture of that. Think about the kind of body language you're going to have. And you know what we're going to do today? We're going to have some real fun today. I'm going to make things at times a little bit tough for you. OK, there's going to be, I'm going to limit some space for you and I'm going to be a bit more demanding on you today. Uh, I'm just giving you uh, some advanced warning there. What I, one of the things I really want you to do, I want you guys to keep great body language no matter what today. And I want you to support each other with your vocals because, you know, it, I'm, I am going to make this a little bit tough for you. OK, um, but it's because I'm passionate about you guys getting better. So we'll, we'll have some fun with that today. And I'll throw in a few reminders as well about the body language. Wow. You've got one minute of reinforcing some mindset stuff. You're going to play with your stretch and support volumes, your dials. Uh, you're going to play about with your environment. You know, you're going to play with your communication. You're going to get them communicating psych social model and you're really demonstrating the integration between psychosocial technical tactical physical sides of the game they are integrated that you cannot isolate them and and i'm going to get back on my bugbear here We're back to the start is that when coaches there's nothing that winds me up more than coaches going yeah i covered the uh, uh the tech corner and i covered the physical corner there and oh i just had to think about covering the psych corner what could i do there no wrong 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 okay psychosocial is every single second of your activity okay it's every single second and it's, it's, it's as i say to players you're always practicing your psychosocial. Uh, you are always practicing your psychosocial. And, and for coaches, every single second of your session, and this is why coaching is one of the toughest professions or hobbies to have because you're dealing with diff people's different needs, wants, hopes, doubts, expectations, beliefs, attitudes, etc., etc. You're dealing with human beings, and that brings complexity. You know, the game might be simple. Humans are complex. When people say, oh, football's a simple game, Dan, what do you talking about with your rambling tweets football may well may or may not be simple human beings who compete in football are not simple humans are complex so psychosocial is every single second out there and i urge coaches to sit down and think with their upcoming sessions if they've got the chance uh, because i know a lot you know don't necessarily have the chance but think about how can i integrate psychosocial into it sorry i'm going off on tangents i know no. No, I think, again, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, um, firstly, I, 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 this is one of my interesting observations, and I'd be very interested to get your take on this. So um, I think you, this is say something controversial, but stick with me. Um, I think you sports psychologists um, are, I th my mission is for you guys to be out of a job. <laughs> and I, what I mean is... Um, not out of a job, out of the job that you currently do. So my experiences of working in golf, I know things have probably changed, but my experience of working in golf uh, were that we had, we, we didn't have any, or we had very, very few performance coaches. Now, what I mean by that is, uh, going back to your point around, you know, performance is a behaviour and all that sort of stuff. What we had were technical consultants. So there were people who would help somebody with their, predominantly their golf swing or the technical aspects of their golf game. And that was it. That was all they would do. And what you then had was you had sports psychologists who would be working as part of a, you know, kind of a national team program who would basically do all of the performance stuff. So devising, you know, you would basically, the psych would 
would do the psychosocial bit. So you had your technical person there and the psychosocial go, right, now we're going to design something that's going to, going to challenge them psychologically. Now, in my mind, that's not what sports psych should be doing, because that's what coaches should be doing. If, you, if, you, if you're serious about behaviour change, you're serious about performance, you should be doing that as a coach. Otherwise, what are you doing? You're not going to translate it into performance. And so I feel that what the sports psychologist should be doing is much more of the really difficult, challenging stuff that comes from human beings who present, like you say, with emotional baggage or limiting beliefs or all these sorts of things you know so much more what i call like that clinical piece working with you know uh, and really unlocking under because that's difficult that's what you're trained in but what i see most psychs doing is basically backfilling what is i i believe to be a coaching role and it it just never i could never quite square it in my mind why that was the case um and partly of that partly that's to do with the training so the training tends to be technical tactical it doesn't tend to have very much psychological involvement in it at all and i think until that changes we're probably going to be in this situation so i don't want you to be out of a job i just want you to be out of the job that psychs are currently doing they ought to be working in a different way in my view yeah I, look, okay so prepare for five minutes here um, and i'm <laughs> going to prepare for going off a tangent because it's the way my brain works unfortunately um so i'm going to begin with the end of my because what you said is is okay by end in mind, what I mean is I'm going to work with the elite level down because what you've said, I'm going to I'm going to tell you about the effect it has, say, on a European tour golfer or a US, a US tour, the best golfers in the world. Yeah. OK, is that they have a maladaptive relationship with their swing in their game. I'm going to say that again. They have a maladaptive relationship with their swing in their game because of exactly what you've just said, because the the belief system that happens in golf, the schematic, and look, this is my opinion, but uh, I, I, I believe I'm right, okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> is that because I deal with this every bloody day, okay, is that whenever a golfer, golf is a game of C, golf is a game of B minus, what I mean by that is, is the best golfers in, in the world function on B, B minus C, they rarely play their A game, if they played their A game all the time, they'd be shooting 8, 9, 10 under par all the time, so what you find when I work with golfers, uh, and this is going to be my next golf book, probably talking more about this, is that at the very top level, you know, it's about if I can help a golfer, I strive to help a golfer uh, shoot under par on their C game. You do that and they're good enough. They've got enough ability. They're making money. But what golfers do when they play their C game, when they hit a few bad shots, they immediately return to the technical side of the game. So their immediate perception in that moment, what they've constructed in their mind from the background, from their history, of development in that sport is there is something wrong with my swing there is something wrong with my technique it is so technique heavy okay i hit a d shot i hit it out of bounds i hit it sideways that's my golf swing i need to do something different with my golf swing that to me in my opinion and it's my opinion is not true OK, because that is a misunderstanding of how human beings function in a performance environment. OK, to me, a golfer is it, it's about skill uh, and skill for me is a behavior, the execution of behavior. And that behavior will consist of, of, of technique. Yes, but also somebody's natural athletic process and also somebody's mindset, their ability to execute their natural athletic process with confidence, with focus. So what we are in golf is we're socialized into it's my technique, it's my technique, it's my technique, it's my technique, it's my technique. It's my technique. And for 100 years, this has happened. And, and golf coaches just coach technique, coach technique. OK, you want to improve. You've got to get your technique better. And to me, it's 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 just not true. It's 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 like, no, people have a natural athletic process and you need to for me, you need to develop skill. And this is something one of your your guests and your friend Kendall McWade says. I think, again, I don't want to misquote him, but he's very much, Dan, let's stop having a discussion about technique. Let's start having a discussion about skill. How do we develop skill?
because golf and all sports are games of skill and 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 technique plays a part but you look at the top two golfers in the world right now dustin johnson and jordan spieth there's no way in hell you're going to be coaching them their technique they just have a natural athletic process that uh, their their coaches have let them get on with intervened on occasion in the right way um and and they've you know, that develop from there. So uh, for me, what great coaching in golf is, is exactly what you said, is rather than somebody turning up for a lesson, getting them out on a range, hitting shots, changing their swing, it's actually socializing them into how do I develop skill? How do I get the ball in the hole quicker? How do I become a better performer on, on the golf course in that respect? Not technique, 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 technique. Does that make sense? Totally. And, and this is the kind of the bit. I mean, I thought it was really telling. I, I read um, just staying on golf for a while, but um, I read uh, Hank Haney's book. And for those people who don't know who Hank Haney is, he was Tiger Woods's coach for a long time. And one of the things that he says, and it's really telling for me. Um, I, I, by the way, I, I saw um, uh, I saw Hank Haney coach. Um, well, I say him coach. I saw him. He was at the um, European Teaching and Coaching Conference in Munich years ago. It was like 500 pros mm. in the room and they were all there. And uh, Hank was doing this, this presentation with this young pl- young player. He would have been about 14 or 15. He sort of kept moving him into position. It was like a human swing machine, just kept moving him. And this kid couldn't move. He couldn't stay in the position. He kept moving him back into the position. And you could just see physically he wasn't able to hold the position. He kept moving him into that position because he wanted this kind of aesthetic technical sort of thing that he was looking to see and we're talking to coaches afterwards about it so you know, what, what did you think and they're like oh he's amazing brilliant oh yeah so technical oh yeah he really understood he understands the swing i'm like but do you not see that kid he couldn't actually do it and it's like you know do you not think that that was anyway it was a long 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 winded way but in in hank haney's book um he says that tiger had uh, or worked on in training uh what he called a driver stinger so you know he's famous for his two iron stinger which is a really low driving shot that he yeah, yeah. He, he won at royal liverpool playing that shot didn't he yeah and he had he had a stinger version of that with his driver because he always had this problem about keeping the ball out on the left side of the golf course taking the left side away so he, he could he and he said he could in practice he could just smash it it was perfect he never put it onto the course never had confidence in it on the course now, I don't know if Hank realises that, but for me, that is a huge damning indictment of Hank as a coach. Now, it might partially be to do with the fact that Tiger was quite a complex character, as we now know. And yeah. he had a particular process and he, you know, I don't know the ins and outs. But for me, I wouldn't I wouldn't have been happy with that as a coach, that he could do these things in practice. We worked on them, but he never put them into competition because ultimately what what am i doing as a coach if i can't help my athlete get it into into competition yeah i i think look i, I know that quite a few golf coaches listen to your podcast and, and i don't want to get myself into it to, to, to <laughs> problems here but and, and i'm not for one minute suggesting that that any, everybody ignore technique i've been a golf coach myself i get technique you know as the great john jacobs was regarded as passed away sadly last year regarded as the probably the greatest golf coach of all time he said he said the immortal words golf is what the ball does what the ball is, does is determined what by what the club tells it to do you know we know through science that at, at the end of the day you've got to return that club head back to the ball in a manner that's going to tell the ball to, to do something you know to, to help you get the ball in the hole so I, I, i'm not one of these crazy guys who says i can take 10 shots off your game by how well you think but but, but but look at it this way. You know, when I work with European tour player, their default is to go back to their golf swing. Your golf swing is your golf swing is your golf swing. You know, you can make some tweaks to golf swings to help. Uh, golfers function more optimally or move what could be construed as biomechanically more optimally but actually if they're constantly doing that then they're constantly questioning their movement if somebody is constantly questioning their movement then you get things like say the late great Sevi Ballesteros who went from this very this real artist give me a club give me a ball I'm going to send it out there towards the hole to somebody 
somebody who went to see David Ledbetter, and David Ledbetter was great at what he does. I'm not having a go at him, but he, he, he suddenly became this real technician, and his game went. Why? Because he's constantly in questioning mode. So for me, optim, optimal coaching, say within golf, is helping somebody become a better golfer. Mm. As my mate Alan Thompson, who's an England golf coach and coaches players out on tour, says, this, you know, the swingers swing it, the strikers strike it, and the players win. So the swingers swing it. They look aesthetically pleasing. The strikers rip it. They rip it. But the players win. How do you become a player at rugby, at football, at golf? It's, it's technique plays a part. And, and I, I know a lot of your podcasts are based on how do you develop? Does technique play a part? How do you develop the player? How do you involve decision making? And I love your stuff because uh, for me, it fits into my psychosocial model because I, I think that decision making and, you know, the, the perception, action, car playing, et cetera, et cetera is, is all there if the coach puts psychosocial first. Mm. Uh, I'm not going to say somebody's wrong if they work on the technique of a six year old. That's not for me to say because I don't know enough about it. But what I'd say is we need to be very careful. For me, people have natural athletic processes and golf coaching, as you're alluding to, Stuart, takes people away from that and actually put everyday question mark or question marks in their mind every single day about that natural athletic process. As my mate Hume, our European tour coach, would say, your swing is your swing. Your swing is your swing. We're going we're gonna, to we'll tweak a few things, but I want you, the golfer, to take charge. I want you to understand your club head, what it's doing in your swing, as Kendall McWade would say. Have a focus on that. And, and and getting the most from you and your ability, not I'm going to deconstruct your swing. That's just my opinion, and 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 that's how I that's how I see it. I, I, I and I, you know I totally agree. I mean I think this this applies to technique change, doesn't it? Or mm. or you know the development of skill. And this is why I'm so passionate about this contextualized approach or ecological approach to the development of skill. And I'm interested in all aspects of skill. So I'm interested in. Um, you know, in mental skill as much as I'm interested in technical skill or tactical skill. And I absolutely like you. I don't like thinking about them compartmentalized as different things. Oh, we're doing some psych now or, you know, um, what I think is, is it should be completely integrated all the time. A good friend of mine, Scott Draw, who I was um, very privileged to work with at the RFU for a period of time. He's now currently with um, with Sky, with the cycling team. Um and he talks about that. He says we've got to we've got to get rid of the ologies, and actually, you know, so that the idea of the four corner model is great because actually you've got all of these elements coming. But what it, it engenders is is that they're compartmentalised. They're four corners, and they actually need to be integrated, don't they? So we need to think about them constantly, all the time. Now that's quite difficult to do, isn't it? Because you've yeah. you've got to write something that says psych, and you've got to. But the delivery has to be integrated. and that, But the training of individuals to be able to do this is sorely lacking, in my opinion. And it's something we need to refocus, I would say. I, I, I think so, Sharon. I, I, I think I, I would also uh, put the – not a fault, but we as psychologists have to be better. I've always said this in just about every interview that I, I have. I always say, you know, we as psychologists need to be better – at delivering our stuff so we help uh, coaches um, deliver this and understand it and deliver it uh, in a manner that's accessible. Um, I, I really think that is is important um, because I, I, as, as we've alluded to, you know, I think it can be done in every single training session. I think it can be done on match day and it can be done really simply. You know, uh, earlier I talked about eyes off, at, you know, to me, individual zone of optimal functioning or ideal performance state or the challenge state, um, which is uh, challenge and threat state, which is being heavily researched uh, by Professor Mark Jones at University of Staffordshire. Uh, Mark's great. Um, that kind of stuff. I just call it a game face. And it's the messy stuff, you know, the picking, picking words and, and picking a model and unleash character or concept or something like that. And you can have some fun with that with an eight year old. You know, uh, I think every, so I, th I think, think about it like this. And, and I put this out to you, I put this out to your audiences. Can you help? 
can you empower every single player to have a game face? I call it a game face. It's the personality, the character they want to be on the pitch no matter what. So imagine that and imagine that for their confidence. Imagine that for their focus. Imagine that for their resilience. It just needs to be a couple of words or a a couple of words, action based words in front of a a model player, an animal, for instance, a a concept like Unleash Carragher Hell. Uh, Can you help every player have one of those and just have fun with that? But as you're having fun with that, you're training resilience, you're training focus, you're helping them deal with distraction. And that, to me, is individual zone or optimal functioning. Alongside that, let's take, say, achievement goal theory or um, goal orientation. So they're basically the same thing. And that's sort of what goal can a player have going into what goal should a player have going into a game. And in psychology, we talk a lot about having process goals. So I come back to the idea of I think every single coach, let's make me redundant here. I think every single coach can help every single player have clear, concise, controllable goals. In my books, I call it a a match script. I call it a match script. And that's one, if you're a younger player, two or three, if you're older players, um, action-based, clear, concise, controllable things that they want to focus on the pitch. It could be a strength they want to magnify. It could be a weakness they want to improve upon. Um, It could be uh, something to do with the responsibility within their role. It could be a mental thing. It could be anything, but it's got to be clear, concise and controllable. And that's just achievement goal theory. That's achievement goal, helping a player have uh, a task or process goal, probably uh, more so than a performance goal and an outcome goal. And then finally, I would say I think every single coach can help players develop their self-regulation. OK, so, for instance, developing their self-talk, uh, helping players use their body language. And that can be done in such a simple way way you know with their body language just insisting on seeing great body language no matter what in every single training session and having some fun with that so so getting every single player to um, help each other have great body language you know that's self-regulation um with 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 self-talk there's lots of industrious ways to help players have great self-talk so you've got three things there you've got self-regulation you've got eyes off or ideal performance state and you've got uh, achievement goal theory. Now, all these things, you can go into journals and there's lots of papers about these and lots of long words and tough to understand processes and concepts. Or we can call it a game face and we can call it a self-talk controller and a bit of body language and we can call it controllable goal. It's, it's, it's simple. It's not always easy, but it's simple. And I agree with you, Stuart. And it, it's not about, it's not about me losing my job because that's never going to happen, but it is about empowering coaches to have really simple to understand and easy to apply concepts that they can help players with and also help you've you've got to be able to have the athlete and the player do it and the coach so speak their language and have them understand it and you've also got to have the coach and speak the coach's language and have them do it and empower the coach to help the player etc etc so that that's I i think that's so important boom that's um that's uh, there's some absolute gold in there. Um, and now people, um, we've already heard a lot about some of the stuff that you've written, your books and all those sorts of things and, uh, and what have you. But um, some people here might want to find out more. They might want to reach out to you. They might want to maybe get trained by you. Yeah, I don't know if that's something that you can do. So if people do want to get in touch and find out more and and uh, are kind of keen to sort of explore some of these issues how do they how do they do that okay i'll make this as brief uh, as i possibly can the the the, the, the my website is danabrahams.com um and they can get in contact with me on my contact form there um my most used social media as a lot of people know is uh, twitter um where they get to uh to read my rambles daily uh, and that's dan abrahams 77 so that's at dan abrahams 77 um i do have facebook and instagram and again they can just google that and look that up. i think it's instagram is uh at dan abrahams sport facebook is 
uh, Dan Abraham's Soccer. Um, and um, my books are Soccer Tough, Soccer Tough 2, uh, Soccer Brain and Golf Tough. New one coming out in 2018, hopefully. And I have a new online soccer academy, which is fun animated videos for players, coaches and parents to work together on the game. So it's sort of set up in that way where players, coaches and parents can work together. So um, and that's where I'm at. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, right. Well, I mean, I, I, I know there is a part two to this that we're definitely going to drill into. <laughs> Dude, um, we've, we've only just scratched the surface. <laughs> we've got part two, part three, part four coming up. This is going to be like Star Wars. <laughs> so um, one of the things I was going to say was um, you, um, you've, you've given an awful lot of your time already and you've given an awful lot of really great information for people to help them with, their, with, what they, with their journey. Um, one of the things I was going to say in the part two is one of the things I'd really like to drill into as well is is actually focusing in on us as coaches and managing our states and managing yeah our ability to be really effective and I've got some stories I'll share some personal stories I'll share about uh, some important lessons I've learned on my journey about managing my state um, when we go into that part two but in the meantime Dan I really appreciate you coming on sharing your experiences and your knowledge there's, there's like I said there's a hundred, there's so much stuff in there um, that's that's very rich with information um, thank you very much for coming on the show sure thanks so much mate take care cheers so there you have it. Fantastic stuff there from um, from Dan. Dan, really appreciate you coming on. Really, um, really great to share some of that stuff. I love, I love the, some of the things he talked about in that one. I mean, some of the things from me I mean, that I'm going to be taking away from that one is um, <clears throat> using the metaphors, uh, unleashing Carragher's nightmare. You know, that's a fantastic idea, isn't it? Give a player that idea of, uh, you know, convey the way that they're going to operate the way they're going to behave the way they're going to play um i also really took away this whole idea of um you know how sometimes our overemphasis on technique can can actually drive doubt into players and actually give them what dan describes as a, a maladaptive relationship with their game so i think we have to be really careful about the way we bring about changes of technique and changes of behavior um and I also like this idea that um, you know we you're you're a stretch and a support, and this is the way we grow together. We create stretch for people, and then we support them through the challenge of overcoming whatever it is the obstacle that we've placed in front of them. Um, and one of the other ones as well is is that the idea of developing the person, then the player, and then the performance, and doing it in that order, very very aligned to the, the philosophy that um, you know we we adopt on this show. Um, and I think there's just absolutely boatloads that uh, that you can take away from there. They're just some of my highlights. Um, so as we race headlong into uh, the the abyss that is uh, Christmas, um, I hope all of you have a great, great time and a great break and get an opportunity to take stock and bring your your A game or, or unleashing Carragher's nightmare uh, of coaching um, in, in the new year. Um, as you know, I've got a Patreon page, um, and if any of you are so inclined and uh, want to essentially buy me the equivalent of a cup of coffee um, to just cover off some of the additional costs associated with this um, uh, this endeavour, then I'd be very, very grateful. Um, head on over to uh, the talentequation.co.uk and you'll see my Patreon button there and you can sign up and become a supporter. There's a couple of different levels. Um, the other thing for me to announce as well is is that um, I, I opened up the Conclave, which is a, a new um, private learning community. Um, there's only a very few, a very small number available. I uh, have two Conclaves going. Um, by the time this podcast airs, it may well have filled. Um, but if you are interested in in joining the Conclave or being uh, being on one, then um, please give me drop me a line. Um, on the podcast Stuart at the talent and um, the next time I am opening up a new conclave I will I will endeavor to make sure that you're uh, you're top of the list in the meantime have a great break uh, have a wonderful time reconnecting with family and loved ones and uh, we'll see you on the other side